Welcome to EC595 Machine Learning 1. Uh, here we are in Lecture 24 on probably approximately called Ref Framework. Uh, we have two parts of the lecture today. The first part will be spending on talking about two ingredients of generalization. Here we will talk about training and testing error. Uh, we will review the halving inequality and then we will try to interpret the bound. Uh, then in the second part of the lecture, we will try to talk about a, a framework called the PAC framework. We want to understand what kind of problem would be learnable, what kind of problem would be not learnable. Uh, we will talk about the notion of confidence and accuracy, and then we will go over one very interesting example to understand this PAC framework. So to start with, I want to recall everyone's memory about what do we mean by a learning is feasible or not. Uh, Actually, a couple of lectures ago, if you recall, we showed that learning is not always feasible. And here is an example. In this example, we have a set of data points, and each data point is represented by a 3-bit number, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and etc. Uh, in addition, for every uh, uh, string, we have a label, either 0 or 1, that is given by the Yns. Now, we are given this set of data points, and then we want to ask, will we be able to generalize from these training data points all the way to the bottom two rows where we have two testing cases? Now you can see that these two testing cases, they are not appearing in the first six cases, and we don't have the, the label of, of all these two cases. So we ask, given the xn and yn for the first six cases, what will possibly happen to the last two cases? So on the right hand side of this diagram, you can see that we have four possible target functions. These target functions, they have the labels of uh, 0, 0, 0, uh, all the way, okay, so, so the first row will be all zeros, the second one will be all ones, and so on. So these are the target functions. Now, if you look at this case, you can see that, look, I have, I have, uh, uh, I can have a one, uh, for, uh, all the, all the strings that have only one, uh, one. Okay. So like this case, this case, or that case, right? So now you ask them what would be the poss possibly what would be the uh, prediction of the last one. You say that, ha, huh, this is a three ones. So maybe uh, you have three ones. It's not just one one. Maybe that's that should be zero. Uh, but you can also look at the other two possibilities. You can see that here, uh, this is a, a odd number of one, odd number of one, and then an odd number of one. So maybe uh, for the last case, the three one 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 should also be one. So there's an ambiguity in this case where you don't really know what is the underlying uh, 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 target function by just looking at the six six uh, training samples. So in the middle here, you can see that I have cases uh, the 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 final hypothesis for G that has uh, all these six cases that are already given to you, and then uh, the last two cases you can either choose to be zero or one, and there is really just no way for you to decide whether it will be zero or one. Okay, so given all this training example, there's really no way for you to learn and predict because uh, for these uh, six training examples, you still have four possibilities of the actual prediction. You can choose uh, these two cases to be to be zero 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 one zero one zero or one one. They're, they're just four cases, and and there's no way for you to to determine which one is the correct one. So. The bottom line message here is that learning is not always feasible. You only know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. In other words, if there is no correlation between the data sets, the training data set and also the testing data set, there's no way for you to learn and try to predict what will happen next. This is a typical diagram that we understand uh, what do we mean by uh, the, the learning model. Uh, so here we see that there is a, a training data set. This training data set actually comes from a distribution that's called a PX. This PX draws samples to, to generate the training data set. It also generates samples for the hypothesis, for the final hypothesis, which would be evaluated using the testing samples. So the PX will give you the X1 through XN, that is the training samples. The PX will also give you the testing samples, the X. If there is absolutely no correlation between the two, 
then I'm sorry, uh, learning is not feasible. Now, because the, of the presence of this P, learning is actually feasible. So what we are actually asking the learning algorithm to do is the following. We ask, are we able to find a learning algorithm A such that you can take the training sets, you can take all the x1 to x, uh, xn's, and then you dump it into this learning algorithm. The same learning algorithm will have a hypothesis set at the bottom, which you can choose one of the hypotheses to, to make it as your prediction. The learning algorithm will look at the data, look at the hypothesis sets, and then return you a final hypothesis. Uh, and then you're going to evaluate the final hypothesis and check how well you can generalize to samples that are not in your training sample. So let me remind everyone what do we mean by training error and testing error. Then we are going to discuss the notion of generalization. So what is a training error? Training error is also called the in-sample error. The in-sample error or the training error is defined as the the, the probability where you have your prediction is not the same as your target. So in this setting, uh, let xm be the training samples and the h be the hypothesis. Uh, and then f will be the unknown target function. And here I assume that the f is really unknown. Now, if your h applied to xn is exactly the same as f at xn, then you say that the training sample is able to correctly classify. Uh, the training sample has been already uh, correctly classified. And you say that there is no training error. However, if your prediction, your h, is not the same as the ground truth f, then you say that there is a training error. So this is how we define in sample error or the training error. Uh, if you look at this equation, we have a set of data points, uh, x1 to xn, these are the training set, and then you have a target function f. Uh, the in-sample error of a hypothesis function h is defined as the empirical average. Now, you, you can look at this equation here. Uh, here, this is defined as e, uh, e of in, okay, e in, this is called the in-sample error. This in-sample error is evaluated on a hypothesis. Okay, and this hypothesis, uh, it will be given on the right hand side where you have h evaluated at xn, and now I'm putting an indicator function here. This indicator function says that if my h is not the same as my f, then I'm gonna give you a 1. If it is the same, then I'm gonna give you a 0. So this error is really counting the number of cases where you make a mistake and you're summing them up, so you count the total number of cases where you make a mistake, and then you take the average, so that would define the average error, and this is what we call the training error. The training error can be computed through your training data sets, uh, and so as long as you have a data set of a thousand samples, you can just calculate these errors one by one. So this is the training error. And now there is another notion called the out-sample error or the testing error. So again, we are going to draw samples from the distribution, but this x will be called the, the training sample. And here you have a, a hypothesis h, and you also have the unknown target function f. So if your h is the same as your f, then you can say that your training sample has been correctly classified. Now, since x is drawn from p, you need to calculate the probability of error, and that is called the out-sample error. So let's look at the definition here. So the out-sample error, or the testing error, is defined as this probability. So it's the same event that's inside the probability where you have h that is not the same as f. Now, note that here I'm not evaluating only on the x-ins, but I am evaluating the, on the x, where x, if you look at the top, we are drawing the x from the distribution of p. Okay, so this is the, the, the testing error. And the testing error, as you re remember, the testing case can be extremely large compared to the training set, which is usually very small. So we want to take a closer look between the testing error and also the training error. Now, if you recall a couple lectures ago, we tried to show that the training error is really the empirical average of the testing error. If you look at the, these two equations one by one, you realize one is the finite sample case, the other one is the probability. However, they are, they are closely related as follows. Um, so um, 
To understand these two equations, we realize that both are in terms of the hypothesis H. So I'm not just evaluating the, the training sets, I'm actually evaluating a hypothesis. I want to say, what is the training error we associated with this hypothesis? What is the training error associated with that uh, uh, hypothesis? And this hypothesis is determined according to your learning algorithm A. So if you change a learning algorithm, suppose you change from the perceptron algorithm you, uh, to a support vector machine, then you have a different learning algorithm, and consequently you will have a different edge. And therefore, you will have a different E in, and you have a different E out. For every edge in, this, in the hypothesis set, um, there is a different E in and different E out. And for every training sample, uh, you are actually drawing the training sample also from the training, uh, from the distribution. So is the testing sample. Okay, and therefore this probability in this E out, if you want to be extremely careful, uh, if you look at this equation here, this E out, I have the probability evaluated on this event, and what will be the ran randomness of the probability? The randomness of the probability will actually come from the training set uh, of X, where X is drawn from the distribution PX. So now let's try to, to connect these two equations, the E in and also the E out. Uh, the, the E out equation is expressed as the probability that your H is not the same as your F. Okay, so this is the uh, out sample error. Now this is a probability, and I can always rewrite this probability by putting a term that is either 1 or 0 uh, and put it in front of my probability. So you look at the equation here, the first line of the equation says that I want to evaluate the probability that H is not the same as my F. The second line of the equation, I want to break it into two cases. The first case says that what if your case is actually correct, so you have 1. And then the probability of getting that event, of course, is the probability of H is not equal to F. The second case would be that the, the, the indicator function is actually 0. Okay. And so the zero will multiply with the other uh, uh, probability, which is one minus the probability of having an error. So you see that there's a one, there's a zero here, and so when you sum them up, they will also give you the, um, the, the original probability. But if you try to look at the equation in this way, you realize this is really the event times the probability plus another event times another probability. What is this? This is actually the expectation of the event. So the expectation applied to this event here, uh, H is not the same as your F. So what is the expectation uh, doing? The expectation is evaluating the average when you try to draw samples from Xn. And therefore this expectation is evaluated over the Xn's, and that will be the same according to this equation as the probability of H is not the same as your F. So what is the meaning of this expectation? This expectation is really the, the population mean compared to the in-sample error, which is the final sample mean. Okay, And therefore, how do we understand the E in and E out? Well, the E in would be a, a training, training error. However, the E out would be the testing error. The testing error would be the ultimate expectation that you can get through the training sample when n goes to infinity. So if you send the n going to infinity for e in, e in will converge to e out. So the role of this probability distribution is very important. It says that my, my training sample is taken from the p, my testing sample is also taken from the p. So if there is, if there is no correlation between the two, then I'm sorry, then you have no way to learn the, the, uh, the, the problem. But since they are correlated, and because they are correlated, uh, the way, once you can calculate the in-sample error, there is a good chance that you can extrapolate this result to talk about the testing error. So learning is feasible when your x and xn are drawn from the px. And px says that training sample and testing samples, they are all correlated. If training and testing samples, they are not correlated, then, then there's a hopeless game. If you draw training samples, uh, in testing samples with different bias means that your, your training sample is drawn from one type of distribution and then the, the testing sample is drawn from another set of distribution. 
Think about a situation that you are learning many images, you're learning the, uh, the, the class of oranges. However, when you try to train, uh, you have some, um, uh, some types of oranges, some types of lemons, some types of citrus. Uh, it's just a little bit different from what you really want to learn. And then when you do the testing, you're only testing on the oranges, then there will be some mismatch. And then that mismatch will cause some problem in your training. But as long as this bias is not there, then we should have a good hope that the training and the testing should be pretty similar. So let me also try to um, review some of the mathematical tools that we have gone through so far in order to analyze the in-sample error and also the out-sample error. So the inequality that we've been discussing so far is called the halfling inequality. This inequality is very useful. It will be useful to help us draw the linkage between the training and also the testing. So what is the Hafting inequality? Well, the Hafting inequality is a inequality applied to a sequence of random variables. In this case, the sequence of random variables, they have to be between 0 and 1. This is the assumption for the Hafting inequality. And now I can evaluate uh, this probability of the event. I have a, I have a random number nu. I have a, I have the deterministic number mu. And I try to measure that deviation. And on the right hand side of this inequality, you can see that I have a factor of two times exponential to the power minus two epsilon n. Uh, we will talk about this quantity later. But to understand, uh, this Hafting inequality, we just want to understand how this can be used. Okay, so you can imagine that the new, this, this new, uh, variable, that is associated with our in-sample training error. The mu would be our testing error, or the generalization error. We want to make sure that these two, they are similar. And therefore, we want to measure the deviation between mu and mu, and want to see what is the probability that this deviation is very, very big. By big, I mean that the, the, the gap is bigger than, than epsilon. Uh, if this is big, uh, then we want to make sure that the probability of ha having this bad, bad event is small. And therefore, on the right hand side, we want to make sure that this probability is, is small as n and epsilon goes to be big. Okay? And therefore, uh, this Hafting inequality says that as long as you can provide some kind of guarantee like this, then we can show that the Hafting inequality can help us analyze the generalization error. Of course, there are different types of inequalities, and Hafting is just one of them. But we want to use this set of tools to help us try to bridge the gap between the training and also the testing error. So try to recap here. Uh, the Hafting inequality requires uh, a random variable between 0 and 1. Nu is really the empirical average. And then the probability of choose, uh, of how close nu is compared to mu is what we, what we cared about. The epsilon here is called the tolerance level, n is the number of training samples. Now I guess we can now map uh, what we want to do between the training and also testing according to this Hafting inequality by analyzing the quantity on the right hand side. So let's try to apply the Hafting inequality into our problem and try to draw some insights from this uh, inequality. So imagine that you have a, uh, you have a jar. This jar you contains red balls, and uh, green balls. Now the red balls, they are, they are, they are, you can treat them as the case where your training, your prediction applied to that sample x is not the same as when you apply the actual target function on the same sample x. The green ball would be the opposite. It would be the case where your prediction is the same as your, as your, as your target function. So you can look at these two types of uh, events as either one or zero, correct or incorrect classification. So if you define a random variable as the indicator function, as I'm showing here, uh, if you have the indicator function uh, of, of h not equal to f, okay, so that will give you either zero or one. If it is one, that means you have made a mistake. If it is zero, that means you have, you, you, you are correct, okay? Uh, so you can measure the, the, the these events uh, either using zero or one, and so now you can quantify what is the training error and what is the testing error. The training error is actually just the average of all these yes and no's. 
Okay, so in this equation here, you can see that the, 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 the training error is defined as the average of all the xn's, and the xn's, according to our definition, is the indicator function of whether you have made a mistake or not. And therefore, when you try to add them up, that will give you the average number of the, of the red balls in the jar, or you can call them the fraction of red, red balls in the jar. Uh, and that will give you the number of mu, and that is a random variable. Now, what is mu? Mu is the probability of getting a red, red ball. Okay, so you, you, this, this jar, you can think that it is a very finite set of jars, and ultimately you have a lot of, not lots of red balls. Okay, and so what you're actually doing is that this is a big jar, and then there are lots of samples. If you only take a finite subset of samples that you can, you can have some green, some red, like what I'm showing you uh, right here. Okay, so you are taking a sample. This uh, treat it as your training set, and treat this as your population set. Okay, so think about that. If you now want to get the uh, what is the training error, then you are getting a subset of samples and a dummy over here, and that will give you the, uh, the, the training set, and that the, the, the new will correspond to the training error. So you want to calculate the new, and you want to make sure the new is c comparable uh, to the actual probability of getting the red. So what is the actual probability? You go back to the original jar, and then you calculate the actual number of reds inside the big jar in, uh, in contrast to the small uh, training set that you're getting here. Okay. So now you're, you're trying to measure the deviation between new and mu. You want to see how, how far they are uh, compared to each other. Okay, so now you can try to map this uh, picture to the equation. So on the left hand side of this equation, we are, we are interested in this probability where your in sample error is deviated from your out sample error bigger than certain tolerance epsilon. And on the right hand side, you can see that we have this, uh, the upper bound here, which is two times e to the power minus two epsilon square n. So let me try to remind you what are the symbols. A is the number of training samples, epsilon is the tolerance level, and the halfting inequality is really applicable here because we have either 0 or 1 in our random variables. Uh, and so you can, if you want to be more explicit, you can actually write down the definition of your in-sample error. As I'm showing you here, this is really the finite average uh, events of, of all these uh, 0 and 1, and you're trying to compute uh, this deviation compared to E out, and E out is a deterministic number. And outside this, uh, in this event, I'm putting a probability, and this probability, you can see that at the bottom of our probability, I say that it is the probability of Xn drawn from your data sets, or it's drawn from your, your distribution Px. Okay, and therefore this, this entire probability says that what is the probability that my in-sample error is deviated significantly enough compared to the out-sample error, and the right-hand side says that this is very, very small as your n goes to infinity. So how do we interpret the, the bound? Uh, so you, let's look at this equation again. There are two messages. Message one, it says that you can bound your out-sample error, which is the quantity that you cared about, using the in-sample error, which is something that you know. Okay, So in-sample error is something you know, and the out-sample error is something that you don't know. However, you, you want to know about the out-sample error. And this message here says that these two are, are close when your n is big. That is clear from this, uh, in this bound. Uh, the message number two is also very interesting. What it says is that the right hand side is actually independent of your hypothesis and also your, your distribution p. So you look at this equation here. The left hand side, of course, is a, is a probability of certain event. And this event will be the event on, on the x. Okay. So the randomness will always be the, on, on the x. Now on the right hand side of this equation, you can see that there's no h. Okay. And there is no p. Uh, and, 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 and this is a very, very universal upper bound. And so what it means is that this upper bound actually works for any learning algorithm. 
it works for support vector machine, it works for perceptron and it works for logistic regression. It works for any kinds of hypothesis sets, uh, meaning that you can use a linear model, you can use a quadratic model, you can use any kinds of hypothesis sets. Uh, this is universal to any target function. The target function can be a sinusoid, it can be a, a straight line, and it, it, it can be anything. Uh, you can also apply to any distribution. The distribution doesn't need to be Gaussian, it can be a Poisson, it could be a Bernoulli, it can be any kinds of distribution. So the right hand side of this equation says that the bound is universal. It's universal that it applies to any learning algorithm, from any hypothesis set, any target function, and any distribution. Uh, that makes the, uh, the, the bound really, really useful. That tells you, uh, let's just look at the problem itself. And let's don't worry about the specific things about this problem. I will be able to tell you ultimately what would be the bound for this type of problem.